Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Making It, presented to you by Fireside. I'm Terry Woolman, and I'm happy to say that my guest today is my friend Lee Rittenauer. I appreciate you joining us every week and would like to share my intention that inspires this podcast. Time passes quickly, and I've learned that we should do what's in our hearts and do it well without apologies or excuses. I encourage you to create your life and art in your own unique way and express your artistry with joy and with abandon. Be willing to work uncompromisingly for what you believe in. Success will have a better chance of finding you when you live your life with integrity, focus, and passion. Be selfish with your discipline and selfless in your performance. And don't forget to have fun along the way. If you're joining inviting questions and comments during the second half of the show, so make it count. And all you need to do is request an invite to speak, and my moderator, Dr. Lisa, will bring you on stage to join the conversation. Dr. Lisa, are you with us today? I am there. Nice to be here. I've been gone a couple of weeks. Great to see you, Terry and Lee Rittenauer. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you and my guest ab about, uh, or our audience about my guest today, Lee Rittenauer. For Lee Rittenauer, there aren't many firsts left to achieve. During his dazzling five-decade career, this LA-born guitarist has taken his music through every genre from rock, jazz, pop, and pretty much everything in between. Rittenauer's accolades include 45 albums, 16 Gram Grammy nominations, Alumni of the Year at USC, Los Angeles Jazz Society Honoree of 2019, plus thousands, I said thousands, of sessions with legends such as Frank Sinatra, Pink Floyd, B.B. King, Steely Dan, Foreplay, Tony Bennett, among many others. And yet, when he checks the rearview mirror, the 68-year-old acknowledges he's never made a record like Dreamcatcher. People have been telling him for years, Rit, you got to make a solo guitar record. I said that too, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> this was the one project he hadn't done, and this year he knew it was time. Lee's newest album is called Dreamcatcher. Lee Rittenauer, welcome to Making It. Thank you, Terry. Very nice to uh, chat with you on your program because you uh, seem to know a lot about all of us because you're one of us <laughs> you're right that's that's what makes this the conversations easy and it's it also makes them fulfilling for me that's why i enjoy doing it because it's about our community and uh and we extend outside the community we talk to actors and business people but it's still about the creative process so that's again our community absolutely uh, so I, I want to jump in with something really interesting and, and I, I'll circle back because I've got two quotes from friends of yours uh, and one of them is Jerry Hay and also Nathan East and they both send their best. So I want to lead with that, uh, but I'll tell you what they said about you in, in a moment. Let's talk about your early years because something that's really interesting to me is that not just that you started playing guitar at the age of eight, but four years later you decided that you wanted to have a career in music. Let's start with that, because I, I started young, too, but I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, my parents moved out from Michigan after World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad was an amateur piano player. He wanted to, I think, be a pro, but uh, and it, he's, there was a lot of music in his family. Uh, the, the family goes back. My Somewhere down the line, there was uh, the bugler in the Civil War was related to uh, was a written hour. And and uh, so there were musicians spread out in the family for many decades. But um, his parents were uh, very uh, sort of being a musician was not a thing that you do. You mm -hmm. know? And so a familiar story like, no, you can't be a musician as you have to be a businessman, you know. So him and his wife, Pearl moved out to Los Angeles in 46. The, the parents followed him out. <laughs> it was not part of their plan. And, uh, but everybody here was in LA. That ended up being a benefit for me because uh, Los Angeles ended up being obviously a great music town and a great way to study the guitar. And at one point, my grandmother, when I was 16 or something, said, I, I even younger, she said, Lee, I know you're very good at this guitar and you're very serious and you want to do it, but you have to get think about a real career and my dad stormed into the room and said 
don't tell him that. You told me that years ago, and he loves it. We're going to let him do what he wants to do. Oh, that's great. And uh, so that's how uh, positive my uh, parents were about at least letting me attempt to be a musician. You, know? you must be forever grateful for oh, that. Totally, totally. Yeah. And, uh, he was uh, he was my biggest fan, so very, very cool. And uh, he, he was great. I mean, he called Joe Pass the legendary jazz guitar player up when I was I wanted to ask you about that because like you said everybody's name was in the phone book back then I mean people could actually find each other so but your dad took it upon himself to call Joe Pass and Bernie Kessel right yeah and and uh and Joe you know I had a couple lessons <laughs> with and I was close to Joe for for the rest of my life and yeah until he passed and with Barney uh, it was so funny because he I, w I had one lesson with him and he was this kind of intimidating guy and he, he mm -hmm. said, I don't really teach, but he says, I'm going to turn you on to the greatest guitar teacher that I've ever seen. And it was a guy named Duke Miller and that's mm -hmm. who I ended up studying with. And uh, For a long time, right? Yes, for a long time. And then Duke became head of the guitar program at USC. Interesting, very different than the way people learn today. And, and I think the way people learn today on YouTube and, and seeing all this visual stuff and being able to slow things down and copy and, and, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there's great young musicians uh, around the world now. And, and I'm, you know, I have a foundation that supports a lot of these people uh, called six string theory. But one thing about Duke Miller, the, the guy I studied with, he was a guitarist and he knew the guitar very, very well. The guitar sat in a guitar stand at every lesson, he never once that I can remember picked up the guitar to show me something. Wow. And so that was the mark of an incredible teacher. He let me discover stuff. He would talk, he would explain, he would, you know, and, and he was an amazing teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. Um, you know, I was just in, in preparing for this conversation, uh, I was reading on some things and I stumbled upon a really cool story. Uh, you know, with Duke Miller, but with Mike McGuire, our old friend that, who from Valley Arts Guitars, yeah. who we both endorsed, you know, years ago. I was so proud to be, you know, part of that family. But can you tell the story about the sack reader competition at the Valley Arts store? Do you remember that? Well, uh, regards to meeting Mike McGuire. Well, just that there was a this reading competition that was sort of a playful thing that I I never knew that story. I just read it this morning. Well, I, and you're talking about that I was there? Yes, you were there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly the, the story now, but uh, you might have to refresh my memory. But uh, I think I was always a good sight reader and, and, and studied very hard at sight reading. And I think I was 13 or 14 when I probably was there with a group of people and already kind of reading lights out on the music and and uh those yeah guys. tommy tedesco and and other like the community you know yeah. all the the great players used to hang at valley arts and have their instruments worked on or just kind of support each other i that was before i had moved out here well the interesting thing is that when we had uh i met mike mcguire and al Carnes, mm -hmm. uh, at studying with with duke right and, and we would have these guitar groups where we'd all have to to read and they were always saying that that I was already, you know, it sounds like I'm telling my own story I'll here. tell this story. Let me tell it. So what I read was that they had, there was a sack um, that had some supplies in it that they would order there, but there was sheet music on the sack. You know, there was always a piece of music and people would try to read the music on the sack. It was just sort of this playful little competition. And then you walked in all of 13 years old and just read it. You know, where everybody else was kind of, Tommy Tedesco apparently did a pretty good job at it, who could, you know, was an amazing musician and reader. But that was, you were sort of known as a young kid for being able to do that. And I just thought it was kind of funny because uh, I didn't, I didn't know that story. And it's not something that you would ever tell to anybody, but, but I read it and I chuckled and, and I, and it, it just kind of, um, I thought it was so cool that you got to grow up here to have this amazing training the support of your family and and build this beautiful foundation of skills that has created this fantastic life for you and and you've shared the information you you believe in education and mentoring you mentioned your your foundation six six string theory there are multiple albums out uh, that come from 
the organization. Why don't you tell people about six six string theory? Yes. Uh, well, I had this dream in I think it was 2010 to do this album Six String Theory, where I wanted to put together all these great guitar players, and we did that. Steve Lukather uh, from Toto uh, co-produced some of the album, and uh, and and Luke and I we we invited Joe Bonamassa, mm -hmm. and I invited. John Schofield and George Benson and Keb Mo. Mm -hmm. It was just a BB King. It was just a Mike Stern. Uh, you know, it, it was just a, a Dream Players uh, album, and we put together all this music of, of everyone jamming together. So we had all these legendary players on the record. The one thing we didn't have was any new young talent, and I decided, what if we had a competition that we could invite somebody to who's never done anything to be on the album and uh so we uh we had the competition and uh, a young classical guitarist from canada won the competition and he's on the record and and it was the beginning of the six string theory nonprofit foundation which has been supported by yamaha and by numerous private institutes and jazz festivals and and just uh, good people around the world for the last 10 years and we have it every other year it kind of got interrupted slightly with covid and we had a, as did most things yeah. yeah and we had a smaller uh competition but uh it'll be up and running again full steam and it's for piano bass and drums and six divisions of the guitar which is the six that i love it's rock <laughs> and jazz and blues and acoustic and classical and country and so we you know, and the interesting thing, Terry, is, is that I grew up in L.A. Like you, you grew up here, right? Miami. LA? No, Miami. Miami. Oh, OK. I moved here in 81. Too. Yeah. And so but I was here like, you know, since since I was a kid and and right. And I mean, I was born in L.A. And and so I saw all the players that I was competing with, whether it was Larry Carlton or or the studio guys or or even a. Uh, you know, young rock guys coming up or jazz guys or whatever it was, you know. And uh, and then I went to SC and I studied classical guitar and I was... With Christopher great, Parkening. With Christopher right? Parkening, the incredible Christopher Parkening. Who Amazing. Had, you know, the school at, at uh, Pepperdine. And mm -hmm. uh, so at any rate, um, it was... It, but I had to compete with people in LA and maybe in New York, Nashville parts of Texas, San Francisco, but you know, it was more people are now a young player competes with somebody around the world globally, and, right? Totally around the world. And it's amazing and intimidating all at once, you know? And so it's a, it's a whole different ball game now. Did you find back then, you know, one thing that I notice about drummers and percussionists, there's a tribe, same with singers. They kind of all watch out for each other. Um, they refer each other. That happens in the guitar world, but I think less um, because of this idea that there's a competition, which there is, and also there isn't. We're all in this together. But did it feel, did you get the support of other guitar players back then? Where was. Uh, well, what, once you're kind of in the club, yeah. And, and, you know, it's like you're not going anywhere and you've kind of proven yourself, then uh, the then support you're supported is is more there right when you're coming up it's 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 dog eat dog right <laughs> <laughs> and so and you know most of us were very competitive uh, you know the truth of the matter because there's only especially being an la studio musician because that was a coveted something that was you could kind of aim for right uh, and there weren't that many like, positions yes exactly and uh so but at the same time i loved you know, all the guys making their records like a Jeff Beck or West Montgomery it didn't matter, or BB or, you know, any of the guys that were making these records that we were all in love with as we grew up. And so I wanted to have a solo career at the same time. And coincidentally enough, it's it, it I started playing at a jazz club called Dante's, which was mm -hmm. really associated with studio musicians. And uh, I would go and see Howard Roberts there and Joe Pass and all my favorite guys and Les Paul would come in and, you know, all these people would come in. And were you shy or did you get to just, did you know them? You got to I, develop friendships? I was shy, but I almost forced myself again, not to be shy because I knew I had to, I wasn't shy when the guitar was in my hands. Right. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, 
otherwise I was pretty shy, but, and I, as many performers are, people kind of forget that we all know. Yeah. Cause that's how we are, but yeah. So continue. It, exactly. And, and so you never, you know, it's, it's, and some, you know, we always, we always joke with the uh, Ray Parker Jr. The, the <laughs> great funk rhythm guitarist, Ghostbusters. Right. But yeah. he was an incredible studio player. And I always yeah. love to tell the story. And so we were doing this session, I think for Barry White and, and uh, Ray Parker Jr. had just moved from Detroit and I was on the session and a great arranger who's passed now named Gene Page. Gene Page, yeah. Very, Started a lot of you. Yeah. So Gene Page was there and he says, Lee, meet Ray Parker Jr. He just moved here from Detroit. He's, he's an incredible guitar player. He's 19. And I want you to meet Ray Parker Jr. And I turn around and meet this good looking kid. And, and he says, hi, I'm Ray Parker Jr. I'm the greatest guitar player in the world. <laughs> and, and, and talking about competition, I looked at him and I said, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and then after that, we were lifetime friends. Absolutely. He's, he's a wonderful guy. Well, I've, Ray's been on our show if anybody wants to go hear some, some fun stories. Uh, so one of the things that you and Ray have in common since you brought him up is you both started doing sessions at a young age, you know, Ray in Detroit. But is it true your first, you were 16 when you had your first major session with the Mamas and the Papas? Yeah. What was that like? Well, I mean, we're, we're, did, and by the way, had you like, we didn't have home recording then. So you just got thrown into the fire, right? You didn't, had you done any demos or anything or? This, this was a, only an LA story. Okay. So about two years before that, um, there was a, uh, a, a group called, um, I'm going to forget the name of this group. It was a Latin jazz group. Mm -hmm. And this fellow found me through a music store and he wanted to start a rock group, but it had jazz elements in it and, and uh, Latin music and rock. And, and uh, he hired a, a female singer who could scream strongly <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that period. So that was around, uh, you know, in the sixties. Right. So, so then we and we were used to rehearse in Palos Verdes, where I grew up, in this kind mm -hmm. of fancy house on the other side of the hill, looking over the ocean. And they had a manager, Big Joe and Little Joe, and uh, and he played vibes, and and it was a great outfit. And so one day he says, uh, John Phillips from the Mamas and Papas is going to produce our our first session, and mm -hmm. and our, our record. And I said, Wow, really? And you know, John Phillips, yeah, Papas. That was like like the Beatles and the Mamas and the Papas. I mean, it was big, you know? And so <laughs> all of a sudden one day we, we drive up to his mansion on sunset Boulevard. It was right out of the movies, you know, it was one of those mm -hmm. big mansions and on sunset. And, um, we go up and he has a full on recording studio on the second floor. I like, I mean like the real deal. And I looked at this studio at 16 and I said, this is what I want someday. Yeah. And I did have that later on. And uh, so we did the session. The band and the session never went anywhere, but Cass Elliott was there and John was there. And uh, later she, I think, sang some backgrounds and, and nothing ever happened other than the fact that that was my first session, you know? And, and uh, so it was with this band and John was actually producing. It wasn't really specifically for the Mamas and the Papas. Right. But, uh, and you know, the interesting thing else, the rhythm section, because he decided who, whoever was playing drums and bass in, in this band wasn't quite the level he wanted, John Phillips. So he hired a young Leland Scalar on bass uh. and a young Ed Green on drums, who both went on, of course, to be very famous. Ed Renowned, yeah. All the Motown, uh, Barry White you know, records, and and as a he was sort of like the R&B drummer in LA for all right. the sessions back in those early days. And then of course, Leland went on to have an incredible career. Yeah. And, and still does. So, uh, uh, so at, at 17, by the time you were 17, you had already worked with Lena Horn and, and Tony Bennett, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but then you took time off from your career to go study classical guitar. I thought that was kind of a bold move. Did you, was, did, were you already like working around the clock or did you, 
How did you balance that? How did you not? No, well, I, I think at 17, I was still in uh, school and, and also I wanted to, you know, Duke Miller had always, he had recommended another teacher named Howard Heitmeyer in Los Angeles. And I, mm-hmm. at the same time I was studying with Duke, I was studying with Howard some classical guitar. And then I started to get more serious about the classical guitar at the same time, still loving jazz and rock and all the other stuff that I loved. Yeah. And, and still do. And still do. And, and so I, I, uh, he, Christopher Parkening was at the height of his career and on Capitol records at that point. And, uh, on, I guess angel was the division and, uh, and, and just, he was in his young twenties and, and it was like the Segovia had a, kind of appointed him as the next guy mm-hmm. and uh and so christopher uh had an uncle named jack marshall and jack marshall was a great studio arranger and tv composer and also a guitar player but more of a writer and tv guy and and so they were in the industry and i ended up studying orchestration with jack marshall and mm. jack marshall introduced me to christopher parkening and then I ended up studying with Christopher Parkening. And then I went on to USC as a student um, where Chris was also teaching. And, uh, and then Jack, uh, they, that was a strict, USC was strictly a classical music school at that point. As most were, right. And, and as most were. And, and then I, I got to know everyone at the school and, and was, you know, encouraged uh, my old teacher, Duke Miller, to come on board. And so Duke Miller uh, finally took over and started the, the, the popular guitar department. And before that, Jack Marshall was teaching uh, an orchestration class at USC because of Christopher Parkening being there, who was, you know, he was Chris's uh, uncle. And so it was all kind of connected, you know. And, and, and some of um, our peers uh, that y- you came up with are, have become a huge part of that faculty along with you. Uh, of course, Ndugu Chancellor, uh, who we lost a couple of years ago, wonderful, amazing drummer and educator, Patrice yes. Russian, one of your longtime collaborators. Yes. It's a really cool school. As a matter of fact, you know, I was hearing rumblings about it when I was growing up in Miami, and I ended up going to Berkeley, but I, or University of Miami, because that was such a great school. But I thought about moving to LA out of high school just to start at USC or just to immerse myself in the studio world that I wanted to become a part of. So I had already knew that that was a really cool place to be, especially because classical music was generally the, the limitation of what you would do. And, and you and I are in alignment about this. Classical music is extremely important part of what makes us the musicians that we are because we've studied classical music and orchestration, you and I both. And, and I know that you've talked about it when you mentor that it's really important, even in finding your own voice as an artist. Yes. You refer to the, the importance of learning classical repertoire and music. And even if you, you know, are, your heart isn't into classical music a hundred percent, or you're, you think you can make it in that field. It's so, it has been so great for me to have that background for my mm-hmm. tone, for my sound, for understanding. And I, I studied with a, another incredible teacher at, at El Camino College separately. He used to teach in El Camino in Torrance, and his name was Wally Bauer. And this guy, his whole thing was he got so excited about the composers. And he was teaching me at 16 how to, he was, you know, he would take Ravel and the Mother Goose Suite or something and, and, and just examine how Ravel or Debussy would go from you know, from this letter to that letter, like how they harmonically got to this place. And I didn't realize it because I wasn't studying composition. Right. Studying with somebody like that, that got us so excited. Look what this incredible classical could do. And then we started to get to Stravinsky and it was like, forget about it. It was like, <laughs> it was like way beyond. But, you know, he, he went from Bach to Mozart to on up the, the chain and just showing me with all this excitement, uh, like how these composers you know, where they went with their compositions. And that was an incredible lesson. So if you're lucky enough, you don't have to be in Los Angeles. You can be all over the world these days. And, and there's, there's great teachers in, in, in every walk of life. At, and the music universities, whether it's Miami or you're in Texas or, mm-hmm. or, you know, if you're in France or in England or Switzerland or wherever you are, uh, 
you have to search it out, but there's, there's great, wonderful educators all the time. And of course now the internet has really, uh, made it, uh, amazing. And people, I admit people in today's world learn very differently than the way I learned. And right. I, we were needle dropping or a cassette or just waiting for the song to come on the radio, quite frankly. Exactly. You know, and then studying hand in hand with a, a teacher. Of course, we're doing this interview. I, we could be, have two guitars in our hands and we could be doing uh, a lesson. So in right. studying, if you really have the heart for it is, is even better than ever. Absolutely. So, okay. Let's get into something that is personal to you, but this is really was a life changer for you. And I want to preface by saying how sometimes I think, I believe necessity creates opportunity to, to grow both as an artist and to grow personally. You lost your house in a fire and most of your instruments and amps and a lifelong collection of awards and recordings and, and everything. It led to this beautiful solo album. Congratulations <laughs> on finally doing that dream catcher. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's just tell me, tell me the story and how all of this has been going for you. Well, uh, you know, these days you have to preface it, which fire, cause there's right now, you know, especially in California and up the coast. Um, but it was the Woolsey fire and I, I have a house, had a house in Malibu. It's being rebuilt now. I can happily say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that in itself is, is, is a huge endeavor. And, so, uh, but I had had the studio in another location all those years and finally moved it back to Malibu and built a brand new studio and, and had everything there. I remember and, you did that. Uh, and, and it was so perfect that you had it there. You were making yeah. these beautiful records and, and for a creative yeah. space for you. And, and, you know, I, I had my first recording studio at home uh, or at another location, actually, since the 1980 four was the first time so and that was really an inspiration from seeing john phillips's studio uh with that mamas and the papas session when i was a teenager I said, right i want my own studio someday and it ended up being everybody in some kind of way has their own studio now you right know? i mean even if you're in a duplex uh, a small apartment you know it's amazing that the damage we can all do with with the way things are today uh with with technology and the computers and our even our iPhones, right? Absolutely. Even you know the basic setup that you have in this studio now, and and seven guitars, or you know, not a whole. So that day, that day of the fire, you know, I mean, I had everything in that studio so, stuff that I had had since I was you know a kid, since uh, I was eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Right. All the books with Duke Miller, all the stuff I studied with Christopher Parkening, all the awards, everything, you know. So. Um, and and so everything was there, including about a hundred guitars or so, and, and you know, forty, fifty amps, and you know all the stuff that was lost. And that day of the fire, uh, uh, we were on the the ocean side, and and uh, I said to my wife, I said, "Oh, the fire's not going to cross over the highway." You know, I was one of the old timers in the sense I'd been out in Malibu for you know since nineteen seventy nine when I first bought the property out there and, and that was from the studio work. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but th that old timer mentality that no, the fire's not going to come this far, that, that, that was, that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so three 30 in the afternoon, the smoke was getting pretty bad. And, and, uh, finally, uh, Carmen, my wife and I left our son, Wes, uh, couldn't get, he was already in Santa Monica and couldn't get up because everything was blocked off. He couldn't even get up there. And we were supposed to evacuate earlier. I took six guitars initially with me that afternoon. And as we were driving down the highway, I, I said to my wife, I said, we got to go back. She said, why? I said, I got to get one more guitar. And so mm -hmm. I came back and I got my Ramirez classical guitar that, that I love. Yeah. And, uh, but I left the, the strap that was serial number 335 yeah. anyway right. but uh and and of course everything burned and and uh but we're rebuilding this beautiful house back in malibu and we were able to do it we had enough insurance thank god we had people representing us and okay. and you know you you turn lemons into lemonade you know so you got to keep going you know and by lemonade you mean dream catcher and and yeah. also and and a new home 
in and, in, and in a place that you love. Absolutely, you know. So, so we're and you know it was funny uh, in this just the real inside story uh, in the summer of 2018. I now the new studio is in in Malibu. The, all the instruments are there. Everything's there in, under one house, and and it was a beautiful house and. And uh, all the lights were on, and and uh, I drove up to the house, and the house was sparkling, and and it just looked like a lot of stuff was there. And I said to myself, "Gosh, this is the first time I've had one everything under one roof in a long, 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 long mm -hmm. time." And I said, "I better check the insurance." Oh, and wow. it dawned on me intuition. And so that summer, it must have been July or something or whenever it was, um, I. I checked with my guy and, and of course I ended up raising the insurance and, you know, thank God I did. You know. That's a blessing. And, yeah. and also that you, I, so I, was in West... I was a hero in my family for like one minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how quickly they forget. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you were all safe and, and well from, from that experience. I know that's been a long haul back. Yeah. And, um, uh, Let's let's talk about friend. I'm going to read these two quotes before I g get further because I'm thinking about friendships and and I know that they're important to you. And you know, I know that even uh, when I knew about your house, like I just left you a message, like I, you know, just if you need anything, if you need to borrow a guitar, I don't know, you know, just. That, and that, I know that we. That was beautiful. That's how. That's important. That's such an important part of our community and, and just being in life, you know, not just being um, about yourself. And so anyway, two friends I reached out to just to get a little perspective on them and their friendship with you. One is um, Jerry Hay, great trumpet player, horn arranger, extraordinaire. Jerry gives his best and said this, uh, he wrote to me last night, a great, great guitar player, producer, arranger, writer, and artist, and a good friend since I've lived in LA. I've probably worked on more records with Lee as an artist than any other. And each one was a great musical experience with the best of the best musicians. Not only a great musician, but Lee is a good friend who has one of, who was one of the few to call me after my transplant to see how I was doing. It's been a pleasure to have worked with Lee on so many projects. Jerry Hay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, another dear friend, uh, Nathan East, <clears throat> of both of ours, but, and you've been in foreplay, you know, had started foreplay with Nathan and, and many, many other projects. As a matter of fact, didn't you and Harvey Mason recommend Nathan to, um, to Bob James? That's yeah. Right. yeah. This is what Nathan has to say. We were just looking through my date book from 1981, where we had traveled to Japan together, which was my first trip there of 80 to date. 10 years later, we would release our very first foreplay CD. You could hear the band forming on Bob James' Grand Piano Canyon album, in which Lee and Harvey both recommended me when Bob asked them who he should get to play bass on the record. Our 40-year history together goes long and deep. Nathan East. Uh, yeah. I think it's... Go, you can respond, but I think it's a tribute to who you are as a person, Lee, not just as a musician, to have friendships like that. Well, you know, and at the end of the story, if we're lucky enough to be doing music or whatever your career is, but if you love what you do and, and it's a it's a small group that, that has the ability to kind of do it for a lifetime, because when you're a kid and you dream of being a musician, you don't want to just do it for five years. You know, you want to do it for a lifetime. And the, the problem for a lot of musicians is that the business part of being a musician is really difficult. Uh, being a musician is difficult enough, but you have the passion and the love of music. And then if you're lucky enough to have friends and associates and, and like, like Harvey or Nathan um, or Jerry or you Dave know, Grusin Dave, for Dave you, Grusin, yeah. a lifetime friend, my best friend, you know, that I met when I was 19 and mm -hmm. we just performed the other night at Yoshi's and he's 87 hmm. and, and he's still unbelievable. Yes. And, and he's done more things on the planet than almost any other musician. And he's so unsung about it. Right. You know, it's like, so these kind of associations are great, but with a lot of musicians, 
they uh, and not the ones I just mentioned. Th those are all the, the the great ones that also that we know have that balance of family and 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 business and and music and but the music business is is tough and it 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 really kind of is, uh, can spit out some people. So having people close to you um, for a lifetime, you know. So I met Har Harvey was the first one that went to Hawaii in the. I guess this was in the 70s, yeah. And he went up to Hawaii on a vacation. He came back from Hawaii and he said, I heard this great band called Sea Wind. Sea Wind, yeah. And, <laughs> and so they ended up moving to L.A. We got him a gig at the Baked Potato. I was doing Tuesday <laughs> nights with Harvey and Patrice Russian and Dave uh -huh. Houston and Anthony Jackson and, mm. and then Abraham Laboreal. And, and, uh, so, and then we got the Monday night slot for, for Sea Wind. And, you know, that was... Jerry Hay and 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 all the great horn section and yeah Larry Williams yeah Larry all those guys he went on to have an incredible yeah. keyboard and saxophone career you know and yeah so uh, it just you know uh, amazing you know and Bob Wilson and and, and just, Pauline Pauline yeah. yeah a great sing and they did some great records and they broke up too too pre premature I think you know I agree yeah so let me ask you a question about becoming an artist. Uh, I know that there are some musicians like David Foster is a good example who like made a conscious career uh, or a conscious choice of, of saying, I'm going to move away from doing sessions for everybody because I want to become a producer. Other people have done that to become an artist. Other people have balanced both. You've done a really good job of that being your own artist, collaborating with other artists, but also, you know, playing on, Melissa Manchester hits and Barry Manilow hits and everybody, you know, Natalie Cole. And I mean, we could do an hour of me just saying names and I know that you wouldn't, but, uh, but so I think I know the answer to this because of what you had said earlier, since you had always wanted to be an artist, but was it a hard decision? Did, did you step away from one to do the other? Did you have to take a financial hit at some point to go, I'm just going to be an artist and do this? Well, you know, Terry also, studio work at that time uh in the 70s was it was at the height of it you know yeah. it's just so lucrative if you were lucky enough to be one of the, the studio guys in new york or nashville i mean nashville still has a, a bit of that going on but mm -hmm. la and new and new york especially uh and la more so because we had the film work and we had the television right. work so this was the studio capital of the world and and still is for what what it's worth but it was you know now everybody can record at home and a lot of you know studio guys will will do their parts at home and add many parts and and they're working on pro tools or logic or whatever they work on and but in those days we were driving around the city doing three or four sessions a day with know? with your cartage company yeah. bringing your bringing second the, set of gear <laughs> yeah, did you have two sets of gear huge you right know, crates of guitars and trunks yeah trunks of stuff and uh, so you could be ready for anything any style any sound exactly you know your tools and, and sometimes you know uh, you'd end up at a session that you know it was just so star-studded you know it was like uh you know it was ri ridiculous you know yeah. and other times you would um you know you'd end up on a session where you didn't know a single soul you didn't know the artist you you know it and and sometimes you'd end up uh, on a movie session with with a hundred people you know it was like i remember i was always dave grusin's guy right and mm -hmm. dave was doing all these big movies and and all these incredible scores and and also tv shows and 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 so i had met dave when i was 19 um and i had recorded on a sergio mendes record that Oscar Castro Navis, my buddy, the great late Brazilian guitarist, recommended me for. And Sergio had a party at his house in Encino, and 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 uh, at Sergio's party, all the musicians were there. We jammed. I met Dave Grusin, uh, Tom Chobin, the Antonio mm. Carlos Chobin, the incredible legendary writer, was there. Uh, Jerry Mulligan was there. There was just all these people. So those kinds of things would start to happen. And uh, but it was it was amazing that you would. You would do these sessions that, and you know, I met Nathan East on a live gig, and but then we got Nathan into the studio work, and of course he went on to 
have an incredible career mm-hmm. not only with poor play with us but uh you know everybody on his, on his own and and with you know uh, you know he's out with clapton right now again right. Mm-hmm. so he's you know so it's so cool to see uh the people before me that i respected that i became friends with and then the people behind me that had, that came up right steve lukather was one of those uh, he was you know uh i was doing sessions and david page and i grew up together we met on the queen mary playing a casual you did <laughs> that's and, great and, and david page likes to tell the story that apparently i put spain in front of him to sight read <laughs> <laughs> to and uh and and then you know later we met uh they were telling me about lukather and and he was 16 when i met him i met yeah uh, you you mentioned a dugu the great late jazz drummer yeah. and uh who also was a great studio player and i met in dugu on a on a casual uh yeah. whether we call you know whether it was a wedding or a private a party party, wedding party, yeah these, these parties we'd all go play as kids and i met in dugu and then he said you got to hear my girl yeah, I said, "What do you mean, your girl?" She said, well, she's fourteen, but she's bad, and that was Patrice Russian. Right. So Patrice, you know, ended up working with me, and still a great friend, and of course, yeah. heads up the school over at uh, USC. At USA, yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's I love this. The and then you know David Page was telling me later, "You got you got to hear this kid Steve Lukather," and you know, so it, it's very cool to have this connection with all these folks. Yeah. Oh, it's it's wonderful it really is that the history that you all have together coming up together is in is inspires me you know and it's incredible and and i see i see it in the friendships you know i see when you know we're at a festival or something together and and the people that you grew up with there's there's a pride and a joy you know that you all share with each other and in in doing you know rising together and you know digging in i mean nothing was handed to you you know, you, like you said, you earned it. You went in, uh, to, to really be the best. And so let me ask you a question. I want to circle back to something because you mentioned about how hard it is to, for a musician hard enough just to be a great musician, uh, or challenging enough, but then to be a good business person on top of that. So you mentioned surrounding yourself with friends that you could count on for advice, but are you a good businessman or, or how did you learn to be? I know that you're successful. But well, how have this, you balanced all of this? This was, again, a little bit of luck of having uh, great mentors and, and having uh, great teachers. So this teacher that has now passed uh, many years ago, Duke Miller, that I studied with when I was that Barney Kessel had recommended. And I mm-hmm. went to Duke at, at uh, Duke Miller's Guitar Shop on Laurel Canyon. And <laughs> that later became Valley Arts and right. sold it to Mike and Al Carnes and, and um and so that teacher, Duke Miller, he always told me from the time I first started studying with him, because he figured out pretty soon that I was very serious about the guitar and I hoped to do it for a living. And he said, learn as much as you can about the music business as you do about music. Great and advice. That was one sentence. And he, he wow. didn't overly know the music business. He was a guitar teacher. Mm-hmm. And but he was a very smart guy, and 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 again, that was the same teacher that his guitar sat in the stand, and he had me do everything, you know. Mm-hmm. And he had me right. write. He had me write my own chord book. He didn't have me buy a chord book from a from a store. He he explained, okay, what is a C chord? You know, it has the first, the third, and the fifth in it, and and he explained the basics. And this was when I was twelve years old, so. You know, he explained the basics about harmony. So he said, go home and write down every C chord you can find on the guitar. So I, I went home that week and wrote down uh, on the music and, and on the little bars, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, all the C chords I could find on the guitar. So I we went to the lesson. He's, well, what about this one? Can't you play it that way too? And, and, <laughs> and so he would, you know, it was just a, a great teacher that let me discover how to be and i think that's that's uh, an interesting thing in today's world is that there's there's musicians coming up with incredible individual styles mm-hmm. but uh you know you can't just copy one guy you know if you copy your favorite guitar player uh you know 
and that's the only guy you copy. You're going to end up sounding like that one, and it's going to be, oh, he sounds like so and so, you know. And you're never going to get away from that, you know. So even back in my day when I was coming up, I had a love of of every different guitar player from Segovia to BB King, you know, to Hendrix to Jeff Beck, and I didn't end up sounding like any of them because you know I, I ended up learning enough about the instrument and and what my uh what i he heard inside my head I and, I and the last thing i'll add about that is that i was always encouraged to write songs i was just going to ask you about that because i know that's an important part of who you are as, as an artist but also you had said something uh i saw uh a bit of a video that you had done mentoring and you had mentioned that being a writer yeah, I think you said when why writing song. You were talking about why writing songs is crucial to discovering your unique voice as a musician. And I'm a writer and a guitar player and an arranger like yourself. But I still, that one hit me. I thought that's so interesting that you said that. Can you expound on that a little bit? Well, I think you know, especially, especially even more so now, like a hundred times more, with the fact of all the different kind of music. So let's say you're a young musician and you happen to be a guitarist, but let's say you're, this could be any instrument or you could be a singer. It's so easy to explore every terrific musician that's floating around on, on YouTube, you know, <laughs> and, and the internet. And yet it's, it's like, it's still very, very difficult to find your own style because now so more, more than ever, people copy what they can see. You know, so they can slow down the video and they can copy somebody's solo or somebody's style and, and you can really figure it out and, and be a carbon copy of that. And of course, a copy is never as good as the original. And so how do you find your own style? Mm -hmm. One way it, it's seen by like writing your own songs. And if you're honest with yourself and you don't try to write uh, the latest hit tune out there which there's an art in that too by the way so that's another conversation but talking more about becoming your own artist if you write something from the heart and maybe you have to for me i even have to write like i don't know for a, a week and then maybe after a week something might come out that that sounds fresh to me mm -hmm. and so you know it, it's different for different people but it's certainly when you write something for the first time and you step back and you say huh, I kind of like that. If you do that often enough, then you can look at that tune and, and it helps you kind of become you. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I understand. And I know the feeling. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I was glad to hear you said that. Like David Foster and Jay Graydon and Bill Chaplin and all those guys that were writing at that time for, you know, and, and Foster was amazing because he would, you know, he had a way of, of writing for, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, or you know, with Jay, with Al Jarreau, mm -hmm. or uh, whoever they they were, you know, Shaka Khan, or whoever they were trying to write for, and so they used another artist to write songs for, and they invited me often to do that, and I didn't take them up on it, and I'm sorry in one sense because they had all these incredible hits, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, I was writing tunes that I was trying to reflect Lee Rittenauer. Right. So it was the right decision for you at the time. For me, and it's still the right decision. And, yes. and you know, Foster uh, is an example of one of the most successful uh, writers and producers ever, right? I mean, he's, he's just had an incredible career. And we all met him when he was a session piano player. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but the difference between David is that he he had this incredible ability to write for a particular artist, you know, and therefore sort of fine tune a, a hit, you know. So once in a while he writes a tune for himself, but still to this day, not so much, mm -hmm. you know. So right, and Jay you write was, for you, you know. So Jay Graydon was the same way. An incredible guitar player, by the way. Incredible studio. Oh, player. amazing! Yeah, and, and a great LA guy, and and again one of our buddies that you know, that we all grew up with and still are, are mad friends with. And, and then Jay went on to be an incredible producer, mm -hmm. especially with Jero and, and, you know, Manhattan Transfer and other people. And so when they crafted tunes, they were crafting tunes for those artists. Right. I want to, um, I want to open up 
the the room for questions quickly because we're getting towards the end of our conversation and I, and I still have three closing questions for you. Mm-hmm. And um, and I also want to make sure we talk about bike, bicycle riding because I know that's a big part of your life. So, but Lisa, I imagine that you've got something I that do. you would like to say. <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on the audience to see if anyone else has any questions. So if you do, please, uh, please post something so I can get you. But two things. One, I'm in love with your your guitar coach and mentor um, because it's so important that we remember it's the it was it's show business or the entertainment business and for a lot of people in acting the area I came from and musicians and entertain and creatives in general they just want to focus on the art and they think they'll just make money and they sometimes don't even think about what to do with it or how they're going to do it that it, it will magically fix itself so that he told you to be as tuned into the business aspect as you are to learning your craft huge the other thing is your home burning down mm-hmm. a dear friend of mine in 2013 or 14 the black forest fires in colorado lost her entire home to a fire her, her husband 30 some years of marriage their two kids the mailbox was the only thing standing and the metal bumper on an old car that her dad was given to her daughter the bumper was conformed into a piece of weird looking metal now that looks like art. Those are the only two things that survived. Wow. And Mm. I was with her watching her go through this metamorphosis of surviving this devastation. So my question is in everything that you lost in that fire or everything that you thought you lost in that fire, was there something that you gained out of that experience? Hmm. Was there something I gained? Oh, Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. You know, it, 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 uh, it, you know, the, the funny thing was that is that week I had never been in the hospital ever. And, and that same week, right, like one week after the fire, I was scheduled to uh, have an aortic valve uh, surgery. And, uh, and, and so I had to go into the hospital and, and deal with that right after the fire. So it was, uh, everything was kind of a double whammy, but you know, it was like the things that were still standing, which was the family, your family and, son and, and wife and and all the friends that were close to me, like Dave Grusin and and many, many, many others. Uh, and and all the extended family and all the love that came back to to me after the fire and after my surgery uh, and and then. You know, things can be rebuilt, you know, and, and fortunately, you know, we did have insurance. A lot of people didn't have good enough insurance to rebuild. And mm-hmm. so uh, all the other stuff was material, you know. I mean, I took my 49 L5 that my dad mm-hmm. uh, gave me when I was 13, you know, and and I, I got out the, the six or seven guitars that were the most important ones to me. I, I left a bunch, but... That, that's okay, you know. And then the, the music, when I set up a studio to do Dreamcatcher, which was the only solo guitar record I've ever done, and I don't consider myself a solo guitar player, you know, I was always the band guy, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so then to have the uh, solo record, and my engineer of 40 years, Don Murray, couldn't even come over and because it was during right. COVID we we're doing, you know, so, mm-hmm. so I was literally on my own, but I, and of course somebody else had set up the uh, temporary studio for me and, and we bought good mics and all this stuff. And I knew enough, but I had to do it everything by myself, but it was actually more of a thrill because it, it, I had to use all my skills <laughs> to make a record, you know, mm-hmm. not only the guitar, not only the composing, but the recording, the, everything you know Mm -hmm. and so it was for me uh making music was and making a record was still such a joy so to have the love and passion of still making music still making records and still wanting to go on tour and still play for a live audience and still get excited about new music you Mm -hmm. can keep that for a lifetime that's a huge gift right right yes thank you for that that's a beautiful question lisa thank you um lee you know you mentioned wes a couple times and and one of the things that I think is pretty wonderful in your life is that you've had the opportunity now to perform with your son. And I'm curious, uh, yeah, I've ha- asked this question to other musician friends of ours who, as their kids get older, they get to, to make music together, which I think is amazing. 
you know, to have that experience. Um, what's the coolest thing about, you know, performing with Wes and also what's the most challenging part? Well, you know, during the COVID time, we didn't get a chance to play live, right? Because everything right. shut down. And and only only very recently in the last couple of months are we starting to do shows again. Meanwhile, he was recording with uh, another band, a uh, Marvel pop band in, in Malibu, and he was teaching some and doing his thing. But he's 28 now. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we started to, to gig, and he did a guest thing with Eric Marienthal uh, with his band down at, that I played with at and and so and then we did a, a show recently with Dave Brusen and David Nolan West from a young age, but played with West. and and I realized now from because West it's been a, a year and a half since I really played seriously with him, and it was like all of a sudden he's a total pro. Mm. You know, he already had the, all the chops and the skill set and and loved all different kinds of music and stuff, but now you know when I played with him recently, it was like, oh yeah. <laughs> He's, he's like he's the, like the real deal. He can play. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people can play, but ne- you know now he's right. now he knows that when he plays with Dave Bruce, and you know, and you got to dynamically, you got to be right in there under the piano, and you got to support him in that kind of way, and and with this bass player, you do this, and with that, all the inside stuff that you only get to know after you, you've had a bunch of experience, right. It's, right? And you know, it's incredible all these prodigies that are coming up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Luca that likes to say, "Yeah, did you hear that kid? He was in the womb and he was playing the shit out of the guitar." Because yeah. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so, so, I mean, you you know, you hear these three year olds that are playing, you know, Bach or something. It's like, oh my god! Yeah. I know it's just insane. Yeah, <laughs> and and gives me hope too. You know, when like a Jacob Collier comes through. Oh my goodness! In, yeah. Out the gate, you know, and you go, "This is." And when he first started, you know, from the little bedroom videos before he even went to conservatory i was like this is good this is good news there's somebody still understands what a melody means yeah. you know and harmony and, and uh, that's counter- the wonderful thing about music is that there's still great music being made all over the world and there's yeah. still great young musicians coming up my let me ask you my closing questions and lisa if there was anybody that wanted to jump in just let me know okay. uh, but the first one is since this show is called making it what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? Well, since I came from a family that was not professional musicians and uh, I wanted to make it so bad, you know, ever since I was fell in love with the guitar and, 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 I, and I knew that my dad's parents did not want him to become a professional musician. And, and that still happens all the time today. And, and so it's a big decision to try to be a professional musician because it's, it's, and it's harder than ever now because, you know, it's so diverse and, and the way music is made and spread out and, and, uh, and but especially if you want to, you know, get into a, a field of music that is, um, is, it, well, it doesn't actually matter the field. It's, it's <laughs> challenging. And you just have to love it so much that you're willing to like, I'm in it for the long haul regardless. <laughs> That's my uh, golden retriever saying time's up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right on time. Uh, can you share three tips for success? By the way, before I finish this question, your dad got to see you become successful. Yes. Which must have been really just heartwarming for both of you. You know, he was very proud of me. And, and uh, he did the fan club and would write these personal fan letters back to, to people. And uh, mm-hmm. so, yeah, he was. And the first time I was playing at, uh, Dante's the jazz club in North Hollywood, which a long time ago was gone into a parking lot. Uh, but it was a very cool club back then. And he was sitting at the bar and sitting and Harvey Mason had walked in and Harvey had already uh, worked with Herbie Hancock and on chameleon and Harvey mm-hmm. was young and then later it ended up joining me. And, but he sat next to my dad was Mac. He sat next to Mac and Mac said, that's my son up there playing. And he said, yeah. And that's, <laughs> So Harvey likes to tell that story. So he was a very proud papa, and uh, that's great. And uh, he would he 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 got to see the ride. You share that name too, isn't Mac your middle name? Yes, yeah. that's great. My uh, my next question is: Can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Wow. Um, well, 
boy, nobody's ever asked me that question. That's a tough one. I think, you know, depending on where you want to go with your music and, and whether you're a songwriter or an instrumentalist or a vocalist, uh, and regardless of what style of music you're in love with, you know, I think be committed to the music in the, in the best sense of the word is that, that you gotta, um, you're going to have to put in hours that are ridiculous. You know, I, I practiced in the middle of the night before I would sneak up, you know, get out of bed and go practice. My mom would catch me practicing in the middle of the night when I was a kid and I would practice before school. I practice after school, you know, and, uh, and you just got to find ways to do it, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and then you got to be good in the business and you got to be good with people, you know, uh, some, some artists are out of the box are just huge, egotists mm -hmm. and you have to be confident at what you do and you have to be and that that's that funny story i told about ray parker jr mm -hmm. there is that kind of confidence that you need that and we were all competitive with one another and still are you yeah. know right Eric Carlton and i were competitive since we were teenagers and we grew up 15 minutes from each other you know so so it, it incredible you know so but you also have to be a people person and you have to have partners you have to have music partners and you have to have business partners and you have to be careful that, you know, you know enough about the business not to get ripped off. Mm -hmm. Thanks Lee. We've got one audience question from Stephanie uh, before I ask my closing question and then give you your closing words. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Terry. Thank you. Actually, I have to be fully transparent here. I don't so much have a question as I just wanted to fangirl for a minute because I am go. such a fan. <laughs> You've come to the right place. I'm such a fan. And I had to tell you, I'm going to pull one out of the books, but this is still one of my favorite songs. And it's still one of my favorite videos of you performing, which was Rio Funk. Uh, I mean, the musicians, the, the, the popping, the, I mean, it's just, it's one of my favorites. I just had to say, it is so cool to see you here. I have been a fan of yours forever and it is amazing to listen to this conversation and that is actually all i wanted to say so it's just great uh -huh. to have you here Thank and you. just appreciate you so much as a musician a writer performer all of it so just really cool to see you here at lee thank you thank you terry Talk, talking about songwriting you know sometimes you have to write a song under pressure and in 1979 we were in new york and i was doing an album called rio and i was on acoustic guitar for the whole album and i was doing a brazilian flavored record but not straight up brazilian music but everything with a brazilian flavor we recorded some of it in la some of it in brazil and then we were going to record in new york and dave grusin was supposed to write a tune and i had another tune prepared and dave told me before when i arrived from brazil he said, Lee, I'm sorry, I didn't get the tune together and I don't have a tune for tomorrow for the session in New York City. And we had wow. young 19 year old, again, 19, a young 19 year old, Marcus Miller, <laughs> and who was just the up and coming guy and Buddy Williams on drums and Dave and I. And, and so I said, oh my goodness, we're at the power station or wherever, or no, Electric Ladyland. Wow. And, and yeah. we didn't have a song, so I wrote Real Funk in an hour in the hotel room. Mm. Are you serious? That is the best story ever. <laughs> I love that song so much. That's a great background story, Lee. I didn't know that. That's spectacular. Aren't you glad, aren't you, glad you asked, Stephanie? I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. Terry, thanks for having me and Lee again. It's just Thank a pleasure you. to see you. Such a fan. Such a fan. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you and your comments. Uh, it's a great story, Lee. Uh, my closing question to you is at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self, little eight-year-old Lee or seven-year-old starting to get curious about the guitar? Uh, <laughs> that's a tough <laughs> question. You asked some original questions. <laughs> Thank you. I work on that like I do music. Thanks. Uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, don't, don't fall in love with, with the hype and, and don't get carried away with, uh, when the stardom comes, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. it will come, but we, I've seen so many artists, it, it, every, it happens to everyone in some fashion. If you're lucky enough to work so hard and you become successful, 
finally the success kind of starts to get to you that you think you're invincible, you know, and that, mm -hmm. and, and that you can, and that's, that's sort of the ego driven part of it, you know, and you do get that ego driven and the money comes and all the other stuff, but it, it flips over very quickly to the other side again. And so, you know, just, it's a long haul, you know, and, it is a it's a beautiful ride with beautiful people that you associate with fans, with friends, with musicians, with music business people, and it, again, just uh, keep the balance between the, the music and the family and the business, and and you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been uh, you've walked that that road with a lot of integrity, and you've managed to stay healthy physically and and emotionally, and and made this beautiful family and and still continue to create great music so uh sounds like you followed your own advice <laughs> well that. you know i mean we've yeah. all had right we've in, had our moments right incredible roads you know and yeah it's a long journey but uh, it's not easy it is not easy yeah but, but it's interesting know, I, I think music whether you're a listener or you're a player or a singer i th i think music is something that is so healthy and it uh, you know with all this talk with politics and presidential stuff and everything on the internet and COVID and, and all the serious things in life. And they're all serious subjects. And I'm not, not saying, but music is something that we should all be doing more of because it, it's really one of the best medicines in the world. It is. It, it truly is. Um, anything else that you'd like to say to close? It sounds like you've the only sense that it's saying about music again, we were, I was around some family member that, that has severe dementia. And again, when this person was listening to whether it was Brazilian music or Mozart and, and Bach or Frank Sinatra, you know, is all of a sudden the music lines up. And it was interesting when Dave Grusin and I came together again to play after a year and a half and, and neither of us had played I mean, we'd, I'd been playing, he'd been playing the piano and, and they did a great documentary on, on Dave about his career. It's and, fantastic. Everybody yeah, go see it. Of time. And uh, so, but when we all came together and started playing with the band again and rehearsing and, and, and doing that thing that we've done our whole lives, it's interesting how it's like the computer kind of gets aligned again, you know, and mm -hmm. how everything kind of comes back into focus. So, Playing music, even if it's just as an amateur, singing, playing an instrument, taking lessons, having your kids take lessons, something I seriously recommend. You don't have to become a professional. You don't have to slug it out and try to become the, the next star. But, uh, you know, having music in your life is really important, especially with what's going on in the world these days. Yes. Amen to that. I, I second that. Um, Lee. Thank you so much for spending the hour with, with me and with our audience. Uh, uh, and I can speak on behalf of both of us. I think we, we both appreciate all of you spending your time with us. I know there's a, right. a lot of things you can be doing. And Dr. Lisa, you as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Everybody. Everybody, stay safe, stay inspired. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Lee. All right. Next time. Ciao, ciao. Okay. Take care. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman. <laughs>